Hey guys, here we go to um, another video. Uh, it's going to be a breakdown of Dimitri Bivol. Um, he's going to be fighting Sullivan Barrera. So we're going to do a film study on him and that fight. That fight's actually really interesting because Sullivan Barrera, Barrera is actually a pretty good fighter. You know, um, I think that I can't remember who he. I can't remember if he has more than one loss. I know one of his losses is to uh, Andre Ward. Um, and I haven't actually looked at any, any real tape of him, but I know he's a pretty solid fighter. Um, uh, but we're going to be looking at Dimitri Bivol. He was, you know, for some reason, right, this guy's, you know, he's got under 15 fights and he's going to be fighting for a world title, you know. Um, I'm not sure if um, the world title is actually on the line or if it's interim or whatever. But, um, you know, under 15 fights and, and having an opportunity to, to headline cards like this and, you know, even if he's not the headline, right? The fact that, like, right now this fight was on pay-per-view, um, that he's such a big name and only has 13 fights. You know, I think it's – maybe it's 12. I'm not sure. You know, but that's not the important part. But um, we're going to go ahead and get into the film study uh, and kind of talk about, you know, what kind of skills he has. Now, this one's going to be a little more in-depth than the last few um, simply because I watched this round already, um, and it's very impressive. This guy does some some very good things, um, whereas a lot of fighters are looking to have a feel-out round, right? This is a very common, I want to say it's a cop-out, right? When people talk about a feel-out round, and you're going to see in this round, Dimitri Bivol is feeling his opponent out, but he knows how to feel his opponent out better than his opponent, right? Or better than a lot of fighters. You know, when people talk about what a feel-out round is um, and how to feel your opponent out, Usually, um, and I'll, I'll get right into the film study in just a second, but usually people are feeling each other out by throwing hard punches at each other. They just run in there and they're like, one, two, three, and then get out of there, right? Or one, two, three, clinch, you know? And they're looking for holes in their opponent's game. They're looking, right? So like their coach might say, throw the one, two, three, and see if he brings his hands up, see if he blocks, see if he uses head movement, see if he rolls the shot. Look at what he, how he responds to the one, two, three, and then run in there, throw a one, two, and then throw a counter to how he responded last time to the one, two, three, right? So if he rolled it, right, if he rolled the, the left hook, this time throw a one, two, and then make it look like you're going to throw a left hook by looking up at his eyes, and then throw an uppercut and make him roll onto it, right? And that's how you pick your punches, right? That's how... Um, that's how like high level guys they're like they look at their opponent they study them as they're fighting, um, but a lot of times you'll have these quote unquote feel out rounds where the the action will be really slow because they don't want to get countered they don't want to expose themselves, <coughs> and sometimes you just have people walking in circles and not a lot of action, you know they'll be coming in you know or they'll be working their jab only right oh step with the jab step with the jab look for a hole oh and the the most common hole off the jab is They'll put their high guard up, right? And then they'll throw the jab, uh, and then they'll throw a right hand to the body, right? That's a very common one um, where you're looking for your opponent's holes, right? And that's their feel-out style, right? Oh, and then the person realizes that he's getting hit to the body, so now he has to make an adjustment because your opponent is scoring on him, and that opens up other avenues for offense. And it winds up being this, you know, very slow-paced um, uh, deconstruction puzzle, right? Where you throw the right hand to the body because that opened up off the jab. Now your opponent uh, is seeing the jab and instead of, instead of going to the high guard, he's catching it now with his right hand, right? Or he's countering your jab and now you have to deconstruct this puzzle, right? To further take away their defenses um, and make an adjustment. So now, now they're catching the jab with the right hand. So now you feint the jab and you throw a left hook instead. Right? Oh, now he's, he knows that when the jab is coming, you might be setting up a right hand to the body, or you might just be throwing a left hook. So now he starts, you know, who knows what he does next. But you're constantly in this evolution, right? And a lot of times it takes fighters a long time to get into the part where they're able to set their offense up. You know, because that style where you're throwing punches, hard punches at your opponent, but you don't want to make a mistake. You don't want to expose yourself. You don't want to, you know, do all these things. It makes it take longer than it should. And in this fight, we're going to see Dimitri Bivol show you exactly how you're supposed to do this. <coughs> like a master. So immediately comes in, and we're going to look at his kind of active guard, right? So he's got his hand up, right? 
and look at how it's moving right just a little bit of movement right is going to be able to disguise your punches so when you step forward you might be able to slip punches in there um, having good head movement right and you can see him moving his head from side to side just a little bit right um, and his opponent look very stale in his guard he's moving his his left hand down but only when he takes a step right um, and he counters that jab pretty well you know he sees that punch coming and this is one of the problems with not setting your punches up right so his opponent goes for a faint jab right and then Dimitri Bivol shoots a real jab and catches him um, it looks like he might get tagged with his own with, um, with his opponent's jab as well boom right uh, they kind of jab each other uh, because his opponent was um, you know kind of probing with the jab but Dimitri Bivol was immediately countering it to take that away from him um, so I guess in that instant although um, Cedric Agnew doesn't do the right thing off of shooting a, a counter because he sees that jab coming right we can tell that Dimitri Bivol is not keen to allow Cedric Agnew uh, to control the space between them so immediately looking to get in there and make his opponent make a mistake right pressuring him to pressuring him into throwing a jab so he can counter it right now he does get rocked back with his own jab right because he doesn't anticipate that Cedric Agnew is baiting right looking to find out what uh, Dimitri Bivol is doing so in this instance I give the advantage to Cedric Agnew for baiting the jab uh, off of his opponent although he didn't use the correct counter to it right because he threw a jab after his his um, his probing jab right but Dimitri Bivol sh showing automatically right away that he sees that jab coming and he's looking to stop his opponent from controlling the space between them um, with the jab and he's looking to take that tool away from him uh, and we'll see how effective he is with that boom so stepping forward stepping forward and giving him kind of a feint stepping forward and then uh, giving him the same feint and then going up and then look at how he shoots the jab up and look at how he's not even close to this guy right he's not even close to him right he steps forward no way that punch lands right but he gets his he shoots it at his opponent and shoots it at his gloves and is able to keep him in this high guard right and now he can't see that this jab to the body is coming and he takes a step back you know doesn't overcommit and then immediately goes back to his high guard where he's kind of got that active guard again shooting the jab out probing shooting the jab to the body and it doesn't look really set up right but it's not it's it's not that hard it's not that easy to time it when he's walking forward and you don't know whether he's going he's gonna to throw the jab. Because if you look at the timing on it, it's off of his footstep. So step, and then he steps. He takes another small step, right? But if you watch his hand, right, his hand moves the same way when he punches or, or he doesn't punch, right? Now, we've got this pattern he's setting up right here. So we're just going to go through it again. Uh, step small step shoots the jab double jab right jab jab step step boom another small step with the jab step with the jab right and now he's got his opponent reaching for the jab to the body so what does he do off of that because he's a smart fighter he first off he ducks down just like in this jab right here you can see him kind of duck down a little bit see how he kind of changes the angle and he makes it look like he's gonna sell a jab to the body and he goes for a hook to the head instead right now that, at first glance that looks like he's just throwing a wild punch right but because he's setting it up with the jab to the body he's trying to get Cedric Agnew to parry the jab to the body to think it's a jab to the body and then go to the hook upstairs which would straight up be basically a knockout punch if he landed right you have your opponent leaning into it to parry um, so setting up his punches pretty well you know and controlling the space between him and his opponent as soon as Cedric Agnew starts setting up his own punches what does he do takes a step back right he's like oh I don't have control of the space between him and me right now uh, he has free reign to set his punches up and to throw these little probing jabs so he just takes a step back and makes his opponent reset you know um, that does kind of is kind of kind of is kind of counterintuitive to the first five seconds of the round when he looked to take advantage of his opponent shooting that jab by countering the jab but he's also learned that Cedric Agnew knows how to probe a little bit right and if you watch those jabs right there those are not real jabs right we'll watch it one more time and then we'll skip forward right but he's stepping forward not real jabs he's just looking to set up his own punches right and Bivol is like oh, okay I know what you're doing <laughs> now this is really interesting. 
uh, if you watch <laughs> the timing, right? And this shows that Cedric Abney, you know, he's a good fighter. You know, he's he's paying attention. He's understanding the timing uh, of his opponent. He's understanding what he's trying to set up. He didn't get hit by that left hook that was set up pretty well. And now watch the timing on Bivol, right? Bivol moves forward, and then before he takes a step, he brings his left hand down, right? Step forward, left hand down, step forward, and then. Uh, Cedric Agnew tries to time him and shoot that right hand right over the top of that that pattern that Bivol is um, creating for him, uh, and and then obviously tries to follow it up with the left hook to see if it's going to be uh, if it's going to work. But off of that timing, trying to catch him with that shot, you know. And the interesting thing is, is a lot of times when a fighter is fighting like this, they've seen other fighters try to take advantage of that stuff too. They're wary of it. They understand that those kinds of things are coming and they're not, even though they look susceptible to it, they're not as susceptible as, as, you, as you might think. <clears throat> but there he goes, feeling out, right? Remember <coughs> earlier in the fight, 15 seconds into the fight, jab to the body, jab to the body, jab to the body, huge left hook to the head, right? And Cedric Agnew doesn't know if it's gonna be to the body, he doesn't know if it's gonna be to the head, even though he does a good job of getting away from it, Bivol showing that he's not afraid. Um, he's not afraid to let his hands go because he's confident in how he's setting up his punches. And now we have him fainting here, right? Because he's a good fighter. This guy's really surprising me. Coming forward, probing with the jab right there, fainting, going low right there. And look at how his opponent reacts to it, right? Taking a step back off that feint, taking a step off that feint, and and closing his high guard getting fainted, and he brings his elbows down. You can see him flinch and think, oh, elbow to the body. Um, oh, and I want to talk about this real quick. Um, when he when he faints and he, he changes levels, right? So watch Bivo. Um, someone in the comment section of my last video talked about this, how to block body shots. Um, and it was very matter-of-factly. He was like, oh, you don't got to worry about the body shots uh, because you just... Um, uh, you just dip your elbows. You don't have to change levels with your opponent uh, because you can just dip your elbows to block those shots, right? Now, if every time Bivo goes in here and changes levels to throw a body shot, um, and all that Cedric Agnew does is dip his elbows in to block or catch them, uh, Cedric Agnew doesn't have any way to counter, right? Because he's he's bringing his number one, he's bringing his arms in, right? He's he's taking away all of his ability to rotate and throw punches off of it. Uh, because it's, he's putting himself a little bit out of position, um, but he's not in, he's not in a position to counter, right? And that means that any time that Bivo goes to the body, he can set his punches up to the head by bringing his opponent's elbows down, right? But more importantly, um, if your opponent knows that you're only going to be blocking the shots, he also knows that he can waste time on the clock, he can set up his punches, and he can stop you from setting up your punches simply by going to the body and putting your hands down. Right? And getting you to bring your hands down, getting you to, to get in that high guard or that, that shelled kind of defense, right? And stop you from, from making your own work uh, possible. Um, so you do want to, when your opponent changes levels, you do want to change levels because that gives you the ability to catch and counter against your opponent going to the body. Um, or just catch and time them. Right? It's very difficult to throw a right hand straight down you know, and land it on your opponent's head. It's just, it's just an awkward angle. You, you just very... You never practice it in the gym, you know, so you're not going to have the kind of power. So you change levels to get to the eye level where you're going to be throwing punches. <coughs> Excuse me. Got to have a little sip. And then Dimitri Bivol doing a good job right there. <coughs> Sorry. Doing a good job right there. Head movement, dipping down to the inside <coughs> or to the outside and then dipping down again. Right, and then shooting a jab, you know, no understanding that he's safe to do this because he's giving his opponent different looks. He's making his opponent think about what he's doing, and he's able to control him with the jab. And he's able to control him <coughs> with the head movement, right? So comes in, comes in, and then he dips down right here, right? The same thing what he was doing with the body shot, right? But his opponent, because he's not changing levels with him, he's just getting his high guard up and he's just squeezing his elbows to block the shot. Right, he's being controlled, right? Because every time, <coughs> excuse me, every time he dips down like this, his opponent has to react, right? If he's not reacting, then he's gonna start getting hit with shots to the body. He's gonna start getting hit with those shots because he's not respecting the feints. <coughs> 
And that's how uh, Cedric Agnew is being controlled. Like I talk about it, think about it like a controller on a video game, right? Or like on the on your TV remote. You want to turn the volume up, right? Boom, you press the volume up button. You want Cedric Agnew to put his guard together, right? And kind of bring his elbows down. So you faint him to the body like this. You give him a little dip and then you get him to bring his guard up. And then as soon as he starts splitting his guard off the faint, right? together and then as soon as he starts splitting him you shoot a jab in there right and you made him do that you made him make a mistake right and that's what it, controlling your opponent means right you can do it a lot of ways you can do it with your head movement you know you're fainting you're probing uh, and you can do it physically by stopping your your opponent from being able to transfer their weight to throw their punches stopping them from being able to transfer their weight um, and turn or take or pivot or change angles by by using block removal techniques and pulling their guard down. Um, you can control your opponent in so many different ways. Um, and in boxing, usually the fighter with the most control over their opponent is the one that wins the fight. And then again, going to the body again, right? So he goes, he does the feint, shoots the jab to the head, and then his opponent's not respecting to it and shoots the jab to the body. Now, getting back to the guy who said that um, bringing your elbows in, right? What counter punches can... Uh, Cedric Agnew throw from this position, right? He can't really throw any. You know, maybe if he was only parrying with the right hand or blocking with the right hand with the elbow, he might be able to turn and throw a left hook. Maybe, right? But look at how far away Dimitri Bivol is because he's using a straight punch to the body. He's not anywhere near range for, for a short punch like a hook, right? <clears throat> but anyway, moving on. Um, and Dimitri Bivol, you know, again, you know, not super active guard, but it's active enough. Like, look at this, how he's walking forward, you know. Dips to the right a little bit, dips to the left, gets a different look at him, right? Maybe that opens up the right hand for him just to sneak it in. And then when he's transitioning again, he shoots a jab through the, through the middle of the guard. <coughs> Boom, right? And Cedric Agnew trying to time it, trying to find time to, to catch him with the shot because he knows that he needs to control the distance between them. <coughs> He understands this basic concept, but he doesn't understand all of the different avenues that you have um, to do it. One of the reasons, and this was a, a very interesting uh, topic of debate during the Vasily lomachenko Guillermo Rigando fight, was that Lomachenko was going to waste so much energy doing the fainting and the probing and the head movement and the bobbing and the weaving and the slipping and the rolling and the dancing. Um, and Lomachenko and uh, Rigando was going to smash him because it was a waste of energy. He was going to tire him out. Uh, he was going to do this and he was going to do that. But because he did all that stuff, he makes his opponent do it, right? Because they have to play in the same dance. Um, otherwise, when they're not respecting the feint, they get caught with punches they don't see because they're not expecting them. Mm. Um, I don't remember where the fuck I was going with that. But anyway, moving forward. Um, oh, yes. And then it becomes very difficult once you give that real estate away to take it back from your opponent because now they're already in there and they're able to set their punches up. They're able to wait while they're too close for you to control the space between them to throw punches at them because now if you commit to a punch, you're in range for them to hit you with short punches, you know, and hard punches. Um, anyway, Bivol going back to the lead hand, controlling him, changing angles. And as soon as Agnew says, uh, hey, hey, that's close enough, right? He starts dipping to the outside, right? And Agnew starts shooting the jab and says, hey, stop that. You know, tries to control the space between them. Going to the body again. That high guard. Ooh, and now timing the jab, right? Very good work. And this is what happens when you when you control the space against you and your opponent, right? And you're the one fainting, and you're the one probing, and you're the one making your opponent think. He's looking for opportunities to take advantage of those timings, but he doesn't realize that you're waiting for those timings too. You know that he's doing that. Because of the fact that Cedric Avenue is not fainting, he's not probing, he's not setting up his punches, you know that any punch that he throws, he's just going to straight up commit to, right? And he shoots that jab right there, and Dimitri Bivol is very easily able to slip it and shoot his own jab. Good head movement again, and very easily able to disguise the shot. But Cedric Agnew, you know, understands that when he leans forward like that, <coughs> those punches are coming off that step, right? 
coming forward. And now, all the punches that he's thrown so far in the first minute of the round, does this look like it's a feel-out round, you guys? Just type in the chat real quick, you know, be like, hey guys, uh, this is a really slow pace round. It doesn't look like Bivol's really trying to do anything. It doesn't look like Cedric Agnew's trying to do anything. Well, Ag Agnew's not doing anything. He's doing that typical feel out round where he's looking for his opponent to make mistakes. He's looking, you know, he's watching with his eyes, but he's not using his brain to control Bivol and make him walk him into a mistake like Bivol is doing to him, right? You got Bivol. You know, shooting that jab right there, probing. And now look at this. This is beautiful, you guys. One minute into the round, and he knows how, how Agnew is going to respond to the jab, right? He's going to go to that high guard. So he shoots that. Well, first, he shoots this jab, right? And Agnew just goes into the high guard. He doesn't know if it's going to be a feint. He doesn't know if it's going to be a jab to the body. He doesn't know if it's going to be a jab to the head. And he also has to be worried about whether it's going to be a hook, right? So now Bivol has all this information. What does he do with it? He instantly feints him, then starts probing, probing, and gets him into that high guard. And then just like I said before, the first thing that opens up is a right hand to the body, right? The right hand to the head is kind of difficult. You might be able to wrap it around their guard and kind of hit him on the ear or behind the ear, you know, or hit him in the neck, right? But the right hand to the body, <coughs> you might be able to bring their hands down enough that you can land a right hand to the temple or to the eye or to the nose, right? But Bivol doing a good job and using probes to set it up. Probe, probe, probe. Keeps him in the high guard by controlling him with his left hand and shooting a right hand to the body. Look at how he's committing to these punches. And these are not feel out, this is not a feel out style round because he knows how to set up his punches. He's confident in it and he can just get the work done. Fainting again, fainting, probing, probing. Keep him in the high guard. Look, look, is he trying to make any mistakes? Is he trying to counter me now? Is he trying to catch and counter? Is he trying to throw a left hook to the body? Is he trying to throw a left hook or a straight right hand over the top of my jab? Right? What is he doing? Probe, probe, controlling the, the right hand, shoots a right hand at the left glove. Again, another right-handed probe, right? He knows he's not going to be able to land it, but he throws it <coughs> to control his opponent, make him think that right hand is coming. Probe again, control that, that right hand. Control. <coughs> You know, not being walked into a trap, and now all of a sudden he feels confident that he can throw a right hand and sneaks one right through the guard. Beautiful boxing from him. And then what does he do right after that? Boom. Shoots that jab, shoots another two, and then he controls Agnew, right, and, and takes a step back. And the reason that he feels so confident throwing those right hands right there is because of all the probing. He's already figured out that Agnew's not trying to counter him. Agnew's not looking to set up any counters, so he knows that he's safe to throw those right hands. Going back to the probing, controlling him, pushing him back against the ropes, right, and keeping him there. Knowing that the jab sometimes is going to be a counter from Agnew, so he commits to his jab, and he, he looks to catch, uh, like with a cross block style, catch Agnew's jab and take a step back. You know, still not 100% not sold on the fact that um, Agnew is not going to, <coughs> not going to counter the jab, you know, but Bivol doing a great job in this round. Right, landing many hard punches and setting them up really well, because the fallacy of a um, a feel out round just isn't true. You have the only time you have fighters like that are fighters who are not confident in setting up their punches. They're not confident in their understanding of boxing and boxing theory that they can throw hard punches off of their setup because they're they're not confident that that they're going to be able to make their opponent react in the way that they want them to react. And they're also not even trying to make their opponent make mistakes. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, doing a good job landing those shots. Comes in, faint, faint, right? And now he knows that that the right hand to the body is open just like it was before because his opponent's bringing his gloves up and he just shoots the right hand to the body. And again, Agnew not in a position to counter, right? Now Agnew doesn't know whether it's gonna be a jab or it's gonna be a probe, right? So he's not responding to the feints very well now, right? Because he needs to keep his, his, his guard open so that he can see the right hand to the body and maybe he can slip it, maybe he, I mean not slip it, maybe he can, um, 
uh, block it with his left hand, come over the top with a right hand, block it with his left hand, and then come back with a left hook, you know. But he needs to be able to see the punch coming, otherwise it's going to just keep landing uh, because um, Bivol is controlling him and making him get into that high guard, right? So, so Agnew doesn't know whether or not he should be blocking the jab or he should be um, taking a step back or countering the jab. Um, <laughs> He just doesn't know what to do right now, and that's because Bivol has all the control of the fight right now. He has, he's the one dictating what Cedric Agnew is allowed to do. And then again, you know, just moving back, getting away from Agnew when Agnew starts setting up his punches. And then going back to controlling him with the jab. Right, and again, Agnew doesn't know whether it's going to be a jab. He doesn't know whether it's going to be a feint. And right here, right, Agnew comes forward, and look at how he brings his guard up. Or um, Bivol comes uh, comes forward, right, and he's on that step where he's about to take a step and then take another shuffle step to shoot that jab. And and Agnew has to bring his high guard up, right? Bring his high guard up, getting fainted, right? And he has to be able to maintain vision of his opponent, but now he doesn't know whether it's going to be a jab to the body, it's going to be a right hand, straight right hand, he doesn't know if it's going to be that left hook. He's just, he's just being set up on every front, and he's just confused. So he's kind of got to eat shots to make sure that he's not taking right hands to the body. <coughs> Beautiful move right there from Bivol. This time he doesn't take a step back because he knows that Cedric Agnew is expecting him to, right? So the last few times Cedric Agnew has come forward, he's shot a double jab, boom, boom, taking steps with both. This time Bivol meets him there, right? He's like, okay, double jab, come on. He gets into his own high guard, right? Boom, boom. <coughs> and the second jab winds up being a hook because Agnew has already smothered himself. And then he tries to throw that right hand to the head, right? But he's so close and it's so smothering and there's no power in it because he's not landing with his knuckles. And what does Bivol do? He just controls him, turns out, and pushes off and is off the line and makes Agnew have to reset. And then he goes right back to the jab and controlling him, controlling him with the feints. Ooh, and he catches him, right? Shows him that feint, right? Feint with the jab, gets him to close his high guard, right, because he thinks the jab is coming, because the last few times, like the last four or five times, he's just straight up shot a jab, and now he comes around the guard and slams a left hook into his face. Beautiful boxing, right? Where's the feel-out process with this guy? Where is it, you guys? Can you tell me? I'll tell you where it is. It's right here. How does he react to this jab? It's right here. How does he react to this feint? Getting into his high guard. Right? Look at look at Cedric Agnew's right glove. Look at how it's almost crossing his face because he's trying to catch that jab. And then boom, he just gets swatted by that left hook. Because the feel-out process, the feel-out rounds, they're not real, you guys. It just shows a lack of, um, I said it too many times already, so we'll just move on, but it just shows a, a lack of understanding of how to set up your punches and a lack of confidence in your punches. And now he hurt him with that first left hook, so he's coming forward, feints him, pushes him back with the right hand, and goes around the guard with that left hook, right? And now he's just using these right hands, boom, to keep Agnew um, uh, in his high guard, right? This is just the very classic style of setting your punches up where you just throw hard punches and you make them react to them how you want. <coughs> um, but again, he's got him hurt now, and he's just able to walk through and throw hard punches. You know, he already hurt him because he set up that left hook so beautifully. And Agnew's in a world of hurt uh, in the first round of the fight. I think this guy at the time, he might have been undefeated at the time. You know, uh, pretty good fighter. You know, it's not that, it's not, it's not easy to wind up being 20 and 0, especially in this weight class when you've got, you know, people who just can start you and with one hit anytime. I'm not saying like Cedric Agnew's like a good fighter, right? But competent, right? And he's down in the first round against this guy. Now Bivol coming forward, probing, probing. Hey, hey, what are you going to do? Tell me what you're going to do, right? That's what he's saying right here. He's he's asking Bivol a question. He's saying, hey, Bivol. Or he's asking Agnew a question. He's like, hey, hey Agnew, what's up, man? Um, what do you think about this jab right here? Uh, do you think a counter jab is a good idea? Let me see. No? You don't think a counter jab is a good idea? Uh, you think that going into your high guard is a good idea. Okay, cool. 
boom, and he'll just split the guard with the right hand and just comes in with a lot of punches. You know, he understands that Agnew is not looking to counter, and he's able to just tee off. Now look at him probing right here. He's got him in the corner, right? And, sorry, boom, boom. He's got him in the corner. He shoots that right hand, or this right hand right here. Wait, where is that right hand? Oh, yeah, this probing right hand where he just pushes him. Let's kind of go back and do it in slow-mo. <coughs> boom, 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 boom. And now he's controlling him, pushing him back with the right hand. And then he goes to his jab, right, probing. He controls Agnew and holds him there so he can throw a right hand. Then he goes right back to the probing jab, probe. And he's controlling Agnew and keeping him in his high guard, controlling him, holding him up into his high guard right there, and then boom, going to the body. And then going immediately back to his control and controlling Agnew, saying, hey, I know I just threw that right hand to the body, but watch out, I might throw a jab too. So Agnew's like, oh, I guess I gotta stay in my high guard, I gotta respect the feint. <coughs> and then goes back to controlling him. And look at these little Peter pitter pat punches right here. Pat. Right? He's just looking for openings, right? Throwing that right hand, not a real right hand, boom. And all those punches where he just goes to the head against Agnew, right? One, two, one, two. And then he goes to a left hook to the body, which is the real shot, right? And then control him because he understands how to set up his punches, right? And then again, right? One, two, one, two, boom. I think I was like a little offbeat on that one, two, one, two, right? One, two, one, two. Uh, and then one, control him, control him, keep him in the high guard, keep him in the high guard. Boom! Swings this right hand around the guard. Now, it's not the hardest punch because he's kind of slapping it, right? It's hitting with the inside of the glove. But it's not easy to, to get power into those kind of shots unless you really close the distance. Uh, but either way, you don't want to get smacked in the face with that hand. And then immediately controlling him again, right? Control, control. Keep him in the, keep his head up, right? Keep him in the corner. And keep looking for counters because he knows this guy has to do something, right? Is he going to move off the line and try to get out of the corner? Is he going to throw a counter punch that might knock me out? What is he going to do? But he just keeps controlling him, not, not really committing to the shots, right? Making him look at it and then boom, goes to the body again, right? And then immediately controls him. You know, this guy Bivol is really surprising me. He's really good for being such a, for not having very many fights, you know? Uh, doing a great job of controlling his opponent on offense and uh, on defense, you know. Um, I haven't actually had to see him do a lot of defensive tactics, but the one time Agnew was able to come forward and throw a couple punches at him, um, uh, he was able to control him and pivot and move off the line. Um, so we'll see if, if we get to see any more defense from... Um, any more defense from, from this way. Oh! Probe, probe, right hand. And then controls him with the jab, right? But Cedric Agnew finally throws a counter, right? Which gives which gives credence to all the fainting and all the probing he does during this entire uh, exchange, right? Probe, are you gonna throw that right hand? Faint, are you gonna throw that right hand? Probe, 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 boom, right hand. And then Bivo goes to control him, and he does kind of get caught with this right hand, Right? But he's able to turn away from it because he's already sticking his arm out there, right? And he's covering his chin, right? He might get hit in the temple, right? But he goes back to controlling him, right? I know he's not expecting the jab and it's not the greatest control, to be honest, because the punch still winds up making it out, but he's doing all the right things. Uh, and Cedric Agnew had said basically a hundred times over that he's not looking to counter at all. But you can see why it's still important to feint and probe because eventually your opponent knows he has to fire back you know otherwise the fight's over so next round we're gonna do one more round uh, talking about Bivol and then we're gonna do some rounds of uh, Sullivan Barrera next time coming in easily able to slip the jab right this is what this is a very basic boxing technique and this is why fainting and probing is so important right because if I'm in the gym with my opponent with my coach and my coach is on the mitts with me and he throws a jab at me on the mitts I'm gonna see it coming and I know how to slip it, right? We might work on that a hundred times in one day, right? How many times am, uh, is my opponent gonna hit me with their first jab, right? How many times? 
Hopefully none, because I'm training it in the gym how to slip that. I'm training it in the gym how to counter that jab. I'm training it in the gym how to counter that right hand, right? So when I see it, right, no setup, it's an easy slip, right? That's like one of the most basic, quote unquote, boxing skills. It's a tool, one of the basic tools that you learn in the boxing, right? And he's able to easily get away from it. Coming again forward with the probing, the head movement, and I love this, right? Comes forward in the high guard, probes, right? And then he steps forward, and look at how he transfer his weight, right? To his left leg, right? And as he's walking forward, and then goes back to his right leg. Just, I love that. And then again, going to the body, right? Off the head shot, so he shoots jab to the head, right? Gets his opponent to bring his guard up, and then goes to the body, right? And now we got Cedric Agnew, um, looking to parry that, that body shot, right? Maybe that's what his coach said. Oh, take a step back when the body shot comes or parry the jab, parry the body shots, you know, do this, do that. And it's interesting because his coach is not in there with him. His coach is seeing what punches are landing, right? And then saying, oh, he's getting hit to the body a lot. What is he gonna say to him? He's gonna say, parry the body shot, right? But he, he might not realize that these are setup punches. Right, that that Bivol is looking for him to to start parrying the body shot. Maybe that's what he wants him to do, right? And then he wants to land that that left hook in there, right? Most of the film studies so far suggest that he wants to go to the head by going to the body first. And again, in the first round, getting a knockdown like that easy because he's able to control his opponent because he's, he knows how to set his punches up because he knows uh, he has confidence in what he's doing. Fainting again, stepping forward, doing a good job of controlling him, probing, right? Hey, Cedric, are you going to counter me now? Are you going to counter me now? Are you going to counter me now? And Cedric is on his bicycle now. He doesn't know what to do. Oh, man, beautiful right hand. So the last few times, right, he steps forward, shoots the jab, right, shoots the jab again. And Cedric is like, oh, he's setting some shit up. Okay, got to move off the line. And look at how he skates off the line, right, kind of sideways. So Bivol's like, oh, okay, I see what you're doing. Comes forward and throws a kind of a winging right hand to try to catch him in transition, right? Moving off the line. Beautiful. And Cedric coming forward again. As soon as he starts coming forward, Bivol's, because he got countered by that jab before, he's not looking to really take the jab away from him, like in the first round. So he just sees the jab coming and he takes a step back, you know, blocks it in nearly the same way, right, that Agnew, that Agnew is blocking, right, high guard, clap it close, right, clap it close, but the difference is he's taking a step back. He understands at this point that Cedric Agnew was looking to set punches up, and Cedric Agnew, <coughs> has control of the space between them at that moment because he can now faint Bivol and throw like a right hand and get him to react to it and then maybe go to a left hand to the body boom catch him with the shot right so he just takes a step back and takes away all of the opportunity that Agnew has to set his punches up now Bivol coming forward shooting that probing jab and gets him into the high guard and comes around the guard again with that left hook right and then controls him with a little left hand on the outside right there beautiful boxing from Bivol so far great Great offense from him, right? Showing that he understands how to set his punches up, um, understands um, fainting and probing. Again, I love this. This is something that I love from fighters, right? Boom, and he shoots a two. Look at how he's using his right hand to set up punches, right? Most people say, oh, you set up all your punches with the jab, but you can see right here that that's not true, right? He could throw a left hook to the body, right? Right, like we saw him do before. We went one, two, one, two, got Agnew's guard all the way up, and then goes boom, catch him with a left hook to the body, right? Sorry if that's really obnoxious, I can't help it. Um, I just get really enthused with boxing, I'll like punch my own hands and stuff, whatever. But, um, but anyway, you can see that he understands what he's doing, that he has a very high level of offense. We haven't had to see much of his defense, right? <clears throat> he kind of moves straight back, which is maybe worrisome sometimes. Um, and he does he moves off the line a little bit, but we haven't had to see too much because he's able to control his opponents so well, right? Very similar to Sergey Kovalev, who this guy might be fighting soon, which would be a phenomenal fight. 
But anyway, we'll keep moving on. I'll talk about some stuff if I see it. Ooh, great job from him, right? Cedric Agnew finally looking to start setting up some counters. And Bibble feints him, goes low, and then shoots a probing jab, right? Not a real jab. And then Cedric Agnew starts shooting his jab to counter it, right? Thinking it's going to be a real jab. And Bivol is like, oh shit, he's coming, bruh. Gets his cross block up and is able to move away from that, right? <coughs> and does a good job of stopping him from keeping control of the space between them uh, by immediately going back to his high guard, by immediately going back to his probing, right? Fainting him, controlling him, and... Uh, because he keeps probing, because he keeps fainting, he's able to stop those counters from Agnew having any kind of effect. Ooh, now this is going to be dangerous right here. Shoots that jab, and what does Agnew try to do? He tries to catch it, right? But he can see now, Bivol can see now that Agnew is trying to catch the jab, so he's going to come in with one. I know he's going to do it. He's going to come in with another one of those probing jabs and go straight left hook. Ooh, and Agnew trying to set up his punches again, right? But because of the fact that uh, Bivol has all the control of the space between them, and anytime, anytime Agnew uses his jab to set his punches up, Bivol just takes a step back, right? So now Agnew is trying to set his punches up with other punches, right? So he tries to use the left hook. But as soon as he starts throwing a punch, Bivol just takes a step back, right? He's not able to maintain control of the space between them um, and keep uh, Bivol in range of, of punching him. Right, so he effectively has no way to set his punches up um, <clears throat> unless he can get Bivol to start reacting to him before he moves his hands. Right before he throws a real punch. Right, so he's gonna have to start fainting. He's gonna have to start using some head movement. Right, he's gonna have to start getting uh, Bivol to think about what he's doing before he does it. Otherwise, Bivol's just gonna do exactly what Andre Ward did to Kovalev. And Kovalev is the best fighter in the world at setting his punches up. There's no fighter in all of boxing, you know, even uh, Lomachenko, you know, that sets up their punches as well as Sergei Kovalev. Um, and Andre Ward was able to take that away from him simply by understanding that when he had control of the space between them, when he was fainting, when he was probing with his lead hand, Ward knew that that was danger. He, he realized that as soon as he got knocked down in round two of their first fight, he's like, okay, man, every time he does that, he's got to move back. And he's able to get Kovalev after that to start just throwing punches, right? To start committing to his offense without setting it up. And that made it very easy for, for Ward to slip, for Ward to counter, um, and for Ward to take advantage of. Even though I don't think he was as successful um, as he probably should have been, um, and I do think that Kovalev still found a lot of success uh, because he's a very good fighter. <coughs> Taking away your opponent's ability to set their punches up means that, that they can only throw punches that are easy to counter or easy to see coming. <coughs> Ooh, I love that move too. Slipping onto the inside, right? And going, hey, I got my guard up. You want to throw a punch? Hey, what do you want to do? And you've got all your weight on your left leg. And if your opponent does anything, you can just snap him with a left hook. Love it. <laughs> and that's another way to set up his punch, right? Another probe. He's like, hey, what does he do when I do this, right? Does he do anything? And then that's how you learn whether you can set up a punch there or not. Maybe he wants to set up that left hook because he, he's seen that Agnew's looking to cross block, right? And catch the jab. Right? So now he's shooting the punch at his opponent's jab, or at his right hand, right, to try and get him to catch the jab, maybe, so that he can start throwing that left hook. Changing levels, shooting the jab to the inside, and now really shooting it, trying to get, it looks like he's trying to get Agnew to start catching it so he can shoot that left hook. I really think that's what he's waiting on at the moment. Yeah, you can see it right there. He telegraphed it. So he comes in, feints him. Faints him with the right hand, right? And he, the the way that you... He's trying to get him to turn away from the right hand so he can come in with a left hook right there. Um, but uh, it doesn't work, obviously. And then he winds up just shooting a jab. Uh, but you can totally tell that the way that he transitioned his weight. Boom. Right here, he's looking to throw a left hook right there. Uh, but it doesn't work. <laughs> Excuse me. 
Excuse me, guys. <coughs> Still a little sick. And uh, Adrian Granados, I know, bro. I know I'm always sick, man. How do you think it feels to be me? <laughs> Love you, bro. <coughs> but anyway, moving on. Oh, shit. And this is what happens when you're not able to set your punches up, right? Boom, you just get countered, right? Because of the fact that he doesn't have control of the space between them, because he doesn't, he's not setting his punches up well, and all he's doing is he doesn't know how to feint. He just sticks his glove out there. It's like a decent probe, right? <laughs> if you watch it, it's like a decent probe. But um, he's stepping forward with it, and that's a problem because he doesn't know. Well, he thinks he knows how Bivol is going to react to it, right? Because we've seen Bivol just go to his high guard and take a step back. So what he's doing is expecting Bivol to do that, right? But Bivol, boom, comes in with a counter uh, and is able to uh, crack him, right? Now, this is very reminiscent to uh, Kovalev Ward 2, right? Where Kovalev spent the whole fight fainting and probing and probing and probing and figuring out what Ward was going to do and trying to next level him. So he goes there on step one, right? And he faints and probes and then Ward ducks down to the waist um, t and bends down to his right side and escapes the right hand from Kovalev. Now, step uh, that's step one, right? Now, step two is Ward, uh, is Kovalev fainting him Stepping forward, uh, knowing that Ward is going to dip down to his right, and then just taking a positional advantage on him, no longer looking to use his lead hand as a probe because he knows how Co uh, Ward is going to react to the probe by dipping down to his waist and taking a positional advantage so he can throw the right hand at him anyway, right? Now the next step is that uh, either um, Ward has to make an adjustment for the positional advantage by taking a, a further step back away from Kovalev to stop him from setting up that punch, or he needs to catch him at an earlier um, stage in that, in that setup process and say, hey, he's not probing with the lead hand anymore. He's shooting it so he can take that positional advantage. He's shooting it so he can take that positional advantage. Um, and then land the right hand. And that's exactly what, what Ward does in the second fight when he knocks uh, Kovalev down with that huge right hand. He picks up on the fact that Kovalev is now committing to the jab instead of probing it and winds up countering it with the right hand instead of dipping down to his waist. A brilliant move from Andre Ward. Absolutely brilliant. And that's exactly what we see here from Bivol, right? Rather than taking a step back when his opponent starts setting up those shots, Boom, he comes in with a counter and catches him completely by surprise, right? Now this is beautiful boxing, right? Because boxing is not just about your ability to take advantage of your opponent's um, <coughs> indiscretions, right? It's not just about taking advantage of your opponent's bad habits, right? So, so far the bad habit that Cedric Agnew has had uh, not only is he not able to control the space between him and Bivol because he doesn't have an active guard, he doesn't have any head movement, he doesn't uh, use his lead hand to control the space between him and his opponent, but when punches are thrown at him, he winds up getting into his high guard and just trying to defend himself from there. And Bivol was able to take advantage of that by probing and fainting and going to the body, right? Taking advantage of his opponent's patterns, right? Now what Bivol is doing is extra special because he understands what patterns he's shown to his opponent. And now he's looking to break those patterns and set counters up. Absolutely beautiful boxing, you guys. This is next level stuff, right? Understanding that they're fighting next on uh, level three, right? So. Um, if you're explaining it like that, like it's like poker terms, right? You always want to be one level above your opponent, but not two, because two levels winds up walking into their trap. Because at some point, <coughs> the levels, I don't know how to say it, man. It's poker theory. It's, it's a very interesting level system. Um, but it's, it's very similar in boxing with the fainting and the mind games and the probing, because Agnew is under the impression that he's going to dip out and just put up his high guard, so I don't know what punch he's looking to set up, right? But because uh, um, <coughs> um, because he's able to break that pattern, he's able to catch him with this beautiful left hook, man. Um, and, you know, Bivol is showing that he's a very smart fight, a smart fighter. 
And again, going to the body, right? He knows where the open, uh, the open punches are. Oh man, I love it! You guys, this is just beautiful to watch. And they don't teach this in the gym, right? Like, you know how you go into the gym and you throw, you go onto the, onto the pads with your coach and you're going one, two, left hook to the body. This is exactly what he's doing, right? One, two, left hook to the body. But notice how he doesn't commit to the one, two. He just throws them probing, right? To keep his opponent into the high guard, right? And he doesn't have to commit to the shot, right? You don't throw yourself off balance because you're whipping all your weight into those punches. You're able to keep your eyes on your opponent and make the correct reads, use head movement properly, transition your weight properly, and then boom, swing all your weight into that left hook, right? Any of you that have ever thrown punches at the punching bag, right? How hard is it to throw a hard one, two? Right? Get all your weight into your jab and then all your weight into your right hand, right? And then get all your weight into a left hook, right? But if you don't transfer your weight into those punches and, and you know, turn your feet and do all that perfect stuff, and you just go in there and go one, two, and then transfer all your weight into, into the position so you can throw a left hook, you're going to get perfect left hook every time. It's exactly like if you were just standing in front of the punching bag and then your coach says, left hook, and then you throw a monster left hook. But you notice after you throw a combination, one, two, three, that left hook is never as hard. It's never as crisp. But if you do it like Bivol does right here <coughs> in the ring, you go, ah, oh, one, two, and then you get, boom, you get that perfect standing left hook right there. Beautiful boxing, you guys. And again, he's got him hurt. Ooh, nice. So he's shooting that jab, right? Hard jab, hard jab, throws that right hand, <coughs> shoots a hard jab, and then Agnew ducks it. This is the first time we've seen him do that. And what does Bivol do immediately? Controls his head and then bodies up with him, right? And then stops him from landing any punches. And then, you know, throws a left hook over the top, you know, as um, Agnew tries to control him. Very good fighter, this Bivol. I'm actually... Uh, kind of looking forward to him fighting Kovalev now. I think it'll be really interesting. With his knowledge of feinting and probing, <coughs> it's going to make Kovalev's straight right hand over the jab very difficult. Mm. But we'll talk about that. Oh, I guess he might not fight Kovalev if he gets smashed by Barrera. We'll have to see about that, though. I'll have to do a lot of research on Barrera, too. Oh, beautiful. Coming in, he's got, look at his active guard now, right? He knows he's got him coming in, dipping to the right, dipping to the left, dipping to the inside, I mean, dipping, right? Coming forward, shuffling his hands a little bit, fainting, bringing his guard up, shoots a probing jab, and then he thinks the counter might be coming, and he immediately slips to the inside and throws a right hand to the body, you know? And kind of to the liver too, you know? I'm not sure what he was expecting um, Agnew to do, but he knew that as long as whatever he did, he did it with head movement, he's not going to get hit by a punch from Agnew, right? Uh, because he also set the punch up well with the feint. But great job from Bivol. This is just a... You know what? I don't, I don't think I'm going to do the Sullivan Barrera round next. I'm going to do the rest of this Cedric Agnew. I think it's only two more rounds. And I'll, Oh, man. Beautiful. <coughs> I'll do the next two rounds of this because I think it's only four rounds. <coughs> but this is beautiful, you guys. Check this out. Comes in. He starts fainting with the lead hand. Fainting. Changes levels on him, right? Look at how he changes levels on him. And what does Cedric Agnew do? He tries to control that lead hand, right? Boom, boom. He tries to parry that shot, right? As if it was a jab to the body, right? He tries to parry it, obviously with the wrong hand, and then comes in with the right hand over the top, right? But look at... This is, a, this is exactly what Kovalev would try to do too, right? Shoot a right hand over the top, right? But Agnew thinks it's going to be a jab to the body, but because it's a probe, right? Because he probed first, and then he changes levels on him and makes him think that after the probe, he's going to shoot a jab to the body because he's still continuing to faint. Even though Agnew hasn't shown any propensity to really counter, he's still being defensively responsible. He's able to bait that shot and then walk him into that other shot right there. Uh, beautiful boxing from, you, from this guy. Let's watch that in real time, too. See how quick it is. Faint, change level, boom, boom. You know, this guy, this guy's really good, you guys. He, I can't remember who was trying to get me to do a film study on him before. <coughs> and I was kind of reluctant because in my mind, I'm just like, 
man, ain't nobody going to beat Kovalev, man. That fool's a monster. But, you know, Bivol showing some real skills, some real stuff to get excited about, you know. Now, I want to talk real quick. Well, I'll talk about it at the end of the round. Again, beautiful, right? Fainting with the head movement, slipping inside, fainting, double faint, gets him to shoot the right hand. And the, the interesting thing is, is Agnew is doing exactly what he would learn to do in the gym, right? He thinks the right hand is coming, so he tries to time the right, or the jab, he thinks the jab is coming, so he tries to time the jab with the right hand, because this is what you learn in the gym, right? Exactly what I was telling you, when you don't set your punches up, right? Fighters have trained hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of times how to counter individual punches from you, right? They know how to do it, and uh, Agnew showing here that he knows how to counter the jab, Right, that he knows how to shoot the jab, the right hand over the top of it, but because Bivol is still being defensively responsible, he's able to take that away from him, right, um, and and mitigate the effectiveness of the of the the counters from Agnew, right, and that's one of the most the, the more interesting things. That's why I picked uh, Lomachenko over Rigando because Lomachenko is a master at probing. He's a master at feinting. Nobody can counterpunch against him. Absolutely nobody. Nobody's a counterpuncher is absolutely never going to beat him because he's just too crafty. He, he he's just too good. Now a little bit of um, Bivol fighting a southpaw, right? And it's interesting because look at look at how Agnew looks to fight him now, right? Now I talk about this a lot too. Right-handed fighters when they fight southpaws, they understand how to fight southpaws better. Uh, than they usually do right-handed fighters and Agnew showing that he's no exception even though he's the one transferring uh, changing sides uh, And going southpaw he understands that fighting a southpaw you need to you need to control their lead hand, right? So now what is he doing? He's getting his guard active, right? He's got his his jab up there and he's like, oh, I got to keep him out keep on um, out of range by controlling his lead hand I can't let him set up his punches control that lead hand control that lead hand and now he knows <coughs> That because he's controlling this lead hand, it's not in, it's not a danger to him, right? No danger, no danger, no punches coming. So now when Bivol throws his straight right hand, he understands that there's nothing coming from the left hand, that it's all coming from the right hand, right? And he's able to parry it, right? And turn out and not get hit to the body. He still might get hit to the body. It might be a little low. But because he's controlling the lead hand, he understands that the only real offense at that moment can be coming from the right hand and he's doing the right thing. <clears throat> now that's that's the that's actually what I was going to talk about when I said I'd talk about it at the end of the video is when your opponent is controlling you you have to control them right when your opponent is fainting you you have to faint your opponent's faints right you have to use your active guard and your head movement and that was something that was very 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 impressive to me with Luis Ortiz right is when his opponent was controlling his lead hand he would battle for lead hand dominance and then he would fake battle for lead hand dominance and shoot a jab to the body. Then when David Allen was fainting and slipping on the inside and trying to control Luis Ortiz um, by making him you know, think a punch was coming or think he was setting something up, immediately, um, not immediately, but sometime very in the later rounds, Luis Ortiz would control him with feints and probes. So they would be fainting and probing on each other, right? But because of the fact that that Luis Ortiz wasn't committing to his lead hand, right, when David Allen would slip to the inside, right, to land that left hook, uh, because, or slip to the outside, rather, um, because it was just a, a probing jab onto the, <coughs> onto the, um, the probing, you know, inside or outside slip, David Allen couldn't commit to his left hook because he was being controlled. The effectiveness of that slip to the inside was being taken away because now they're fighting for control, right? Really high level stuff. And that's what happens when two very high level guys start fighting. You wind up not having, um, having like the low level fights, right? Where nobody's controlling either fighter, right? A fight like Keith Thurman versus Danny Garcia, neither one of them is controlling. They're just throwing bombs at each other. Um, and then when you have a high-level fighter who does know how to control their opponent, you have like Vasily Lomachenko versus Guillermo Rigondo, right? Where Rigondo got smashed. And then you have two high-level fighters fighting each other. You have um, 
Well, going back to the Loma example, one fighter controlling the other and the other one just being controlled and it's a shutout. Also like Billy Joe Saunders versus David Lemieux, right? And then when you have two really high level fighters um, who understand how to control each other, um, you have them battling for for control and not committing to a lot of punches, not committing to a lot of stuff. But there's a lot of fainting, <coughs> there's a lot of head movement, there's a lot of active guard, there's a lot of pity pat stuff. Uh, and then you start looking at like tape of old fights between legends, right? Great fighters, and you see that that's how they fight too. They understand that you have to control your opponent, you have to make him make mistakes, and that he's not going to commit to everything. And then you have a lot of fighters standing in front of each other, right? Looking like they're about doing nothing, right? But they're really testing the waters on each other, right? Head, I'm getting too caught up in it anyway. Um, but that's how you fight a fighter who understands how to control the, the space between them is you fight for that control, right? And you don't always have to do it with, with punches. You do it with head movement. You do it with slipping. You do it with, you know, rolling. You do it with your active guard. You do it <coughs> with a lot of things. <coughs> and um, let's see if they show any highlights so I can keep talking for a second. Ah. <coughs> oh, yeah. Boom! Just wrecked him. Watch that again right there. Wow. So anyway, um, and then that's what you wind up having, right? Is two fighters who understand how to control the other one um, and how to control each other and how to fight against fighters that know how to control each other, right? And you have these like just battle of wills and battle of minds, right? Each looking to sneak punches in, right? Very interesting stuff. Anyway, um, that's it for this video. Um, Dimitri Bivol showing that he's a very well-rounded fighter. Uh, very good. We're going to do the next two rounds tomorrow. And then uh, we'll get into uh, Sullivan Barrera and kind of talk about how good or how bad or, you know, how great he is. You know, what kind of skills he knows how to show. Anyway, thanks, guys. Oh, yeah. Let me know what's up in the comments. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know if you guys like... Um, Bivol, let me know uh, who you guys think would win, Kovalev or Bivol. Ooh.